you're listening to Creep Geeks Podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek. So it begins again. Welcome back to Creepy Geeks Podcast. This is episode number 121. Searching for the lost church in Sasquatch with Asheville Cryptid Society and MND Paranormal. Very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello there. Yeah. So here we are again. Welcome back to the Creep Geeks Podcast. If today is your birthday, happy birthday. Otherwise, sit back and enjoy. We have a lot of stuff to talk about today. We're going to talk about our Weird Wednesday series, which continues with where we left off with Andrew's Geyser and some other things. We'll give you a little bit of update on that. Yep. And this time, with our high strangers in North Carolina, we're going to be talking with the Asheville Cryptid Society MD Paranormal and Cryptid Research. And when I say talking with, I'm saying talking about because they're not here. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Well, we have had MD Paranormal on in the past. Yes. And uh, we also have had Christian from Asheville Cryptid Society. Yes. On. AKA Cryptid Guy, that yeah. AKA, fun fact, means also known as. So that's your <laughs> random weird factoid that we like to do. So if it's your first time tuning into the podcast, what's this podcast all about? Well, broadcasting paranormal news and fun stories from our Creep Geeks Bunker Studio in the mountains of Western North Carolina, we're an offbeat news podcast that takes a lighthearted approach to the strange, the stupid, paranormal, and tech topics circulating the web. That is correct. And if Very you're nice. curious as to what our Weird Wednesday is, that's basically where we break down an unusual topic or subject <laughs> Or a trending phenomenon that you've seen in the news lately. Yeah. If you'd like to give us a call so you can interact with the show, you can certainly do that. We have a phone number for you. <clears throat> you ready? Yeah. Get a pen, write this down. It's 575-208-4025. Okay. Yeah. You can also reach us at contact at creepgeeks.com. Very true. Yes. And we have a website called creepgeeks.com, by the way. So you can... We can reach us there. Also, if you listen to the podcast and you like what you hear and you want to support us with very minimal to no effort on your part, you can certainly do so. It won't cost you anything. And all you got to do is when you shop on Amazon, if you use our affiliate link, we'll get a small percentage. It doesn't change your price at all and it helps us keep the coffee flowing and gas in the albino rhino and me. <laughs> And dog. Mean? Well, you know, sometimes you take little road trips and you eat the road trip food, little snacks when you're traveling down the highway at breakneck speed. Sometimes you can get a little gassy. Oh, okay. Not saying you. I'm saying me and the dog. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you're curious, that Amazon affiliate link is amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash cheap geek. And we put that link in the show notes to the podcast. Yes. And if you're going, well, wait a minute, they're the creep geeks. How come they're saying cheap geek? It's because we have another channel. It's our YouTube channel. If you go on YouTube and you search for cheap geek, you'll find the other channel where we do product reviews, how to's, DIYs, all that sort of thing, where we have a much larger following than we currently have here, of which we would like to ask your help and support. Yeah. Maybe you can make us grow and you can help us grow by doing a review. Yes, um, we've included a link to iTunes or Apple Podcasts uh, in the show notes for this podcast episode. But if you give us a rating or review, thumbs up or whatever on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, SoundCloud, Spotify, Radio Public, Spotify, uh, Player FM. Yep. Yep. Basically, anywhere you can find a podcast, you can find us. And hopefully, one day soon, we'll be on Pandora. In the near yeah. future. But those yeah, ratings, when you like a podcast and you do subscribe to it, 
when you give it a rating, it actually increases that podcast's visibility and helps that podcast reach a lar- larger audience. Yes. And we do actually have a YouTube channel for the Creep Geeks podcast. And if you happen to listen there, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Thank and you. And we'll appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So now that we got all the uh, pleasantries out of the way, I suppose, and all the stuff that you typically have to do when you have a podcast, let's talk about something that uh, sort of, it happened recently and it was kind of, kind of one of those things, you know? Yeah. And we we talked about this gentleman before in the past and they are calling him the Grand Marshal of UFOs. So, and by UFOs, I mean just like the whole field of, of ufology. Yeah. And this is pioneering research, uh, researcher basically um, extraordinary. Any, okay, let me let me give you a little background on why I like this guy. To me, whenever he came on the radio, it was legit. Okay. You know, nuclear physicist, all that sort of thing. Anyway, this guy spent like fifty years of his life trying to prove UFOs and UFO, maybe you know, like life, life out there, alien life, I guess. Uh, probably a way to put it, but um, he would also debunk things. So anyway, we're talking about Stanton Friedman. Yes, and the reason this article calls him the Grand Marshal is because he used to be the Grand Marshal of the Roswell UFO Festival. Yes. And he ended up having to not do it, you know, because he was getting older. Yeah, he was 84, and he was actually traveling back from a conference, is from what I read, and he... Uh, um, uh, from Canada, I think, and he actually died in the uh, airport. Oh. So, yeah, but he was a nuclear physicist, and basically in 1978, when he re uh, kind of come across, sort of stumbled across an obscure UFO incident story, he started talking about it. Hmm. And guess what that was? What? Roswell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, I like the quote that they have in this particular article. It says, "I certainly had no idea I was going to become a ufologist and Roswell researcher." Right, because mm. he actually got in touch with Jesse Marcel, and say, mm. and uh, Jesse Marcel was an intelligence officer for the 509th Walker Air Force Base in Roswell. Right, and he was kind of the one that sort of kicked it off. So, huh. yes, so um, yeah, he's legit. Yeah, and he would you be know? a wouldn't he be one of the original hosts or not host guests on Coast to Coast and things like oh, that? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, always, uh, always something um, that when he came on, it was always very interesting. You know, it, yeah. it's kind of like you have Richard C. Hoagland, who is interesting, but I'm kind of like I don't know if I trust about half of what he says, just because it's just kind of out there. Yeah. But whenever Stanton Friedman came on, I completely different opinion, more like, authentic, I guess, more you know factual. I mean, he's a nuclear physicist, and he didn't seem to joke around too much with this sort of thing. There was no BS, you know, no real embellishments or anything. And if you were wrong or not factual in what you said, he would correct you. <laughs> and, you know and, I mean, sort of a yeah. no-nonsense kind of fellow. From what I've seen on the radio, and I've never met him in real life, and he would be one of the people that if I had seen him anywhere, like at a conference or just anywhere, I would have walked up to him and said, Mr. Stanton Friedman. And there's a lot of posts on social media from um, people who did have the opportunity to meet him, like a uh, – George Giorgio Tosakalos. Yeah, Tosakalos. Yeah. Uh, crazy haired gentleman from Ancient Aliens. And, and then there's another one. It was really humbling because this guy, one of these other people, they, they're very large in the UFO community. But when they first started off, they had gotten a booth and they didn't realize until they got there that morning that their booth was right next to Friedman's. That would be cool. And they were just shaking, couldn't even put their booth together. They were very nervous and, you know, things like that. But it was meeting a very down-to-earth yet highly intelligent person. Yeah. You know? And he lived a dual life. He really? was a United States citizen and a Canadian citizen. Canadian, yeah. Yes. But we don't I'll... hold that against him. <laughs> and it was rumored that when he would do his speaks and get a little animated, you know, and get slightly hot up on stage, that he smelled like syrup. What? Stop. No, no really good guy. Pioneer. You know, he, he was a monster in this field. Yeah. A giant. And, uh, you know, 84 years old. You know, it's like, there's been a couple of people that have passed out of this sort of whole community thing that's, you know, kind of got on me a little bit. Uh, Art Bell, of course. Yeah. And Stanton Friedman. Because without those two, I think you would have um, a hard time, you know, pointing. You'd have a hard time sort of looking at 
some of the research that was done and some of the talks and basically the overall subject of ufology without being able to take it more seriously. Or wade through the mud, I would yeah, say. Yeah, because say. when those two guys, when Art Bell and Stan Friedman got together um, or just started talking in general, it sort of lended a, a, a voice um, and some credibility to it. You know, And I, I'm honestly, I'm not even sure how many times Art Bell talked to Stan Friedman. Yeah. Uh, off the top of my head, or if they even did talk to each other. I know he's talked to George Norrie many times. Um, but, yeah, but those two gave, I think, some credibility to the basically all these subjects in, in ufology or UFOs and all that research in general. So oh, well, wow. It was often, as well as, you know, I kind of thought it was. But yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll be honest, I can't remember because uh, our bell was on for a long time. Yeah. So, and the thing about that show, Coast to Coast AM, when it was helmed by Hart Bell. Is it, you know, like it is now, it was on very late, you know. Mm -hmm. So you would listen until you passed out, basically is what we're about to. <laughs> No, so. with my old schedule, long time ago, I would actually listen. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about yeah. the metaphorical you. Okay. You know, there was a lot of people out there that worked a night shift to listen. There was also even more people that would listen as long as they could before they went to sleep. Yeah. Well, that was me. So, yeah. Um, I would listen long enough for the, whatever radio station would actually replay the previous night's show. So, Well, they always did a recap. Yeah. If I remember correctly, they started at like 9, right, when they did a recap of the first uh, – the first two hours were a recap of the previous night's show, and then they rolled into yeah. um, Coast to Coast. And I just sat here and thought about it, and it hit me like a thunderbolt. Okay. We stay up late till like four o'clock in the morning every morning. We should probably try to give Coast to Coast another chance. Yeah. Because I'll be honest with you, I'm not a fan of George Norrie. I've seen what has happened over the years, and it sort of changed my opinion. So maybe I'll give him another shot. We'll see. Okay. It's not like he knows we exist or anything. It's like, you know, I don't know. But that's just kind of my opinion on certain things. So anyway, uh, since Mr. Stanton passed away... I think we have certainly lost a giant in this field, and it uh, it is what it is. So we'll see yeah. kind of what happens. So anyway, back to the show. <laughs> All right, so um, for Weird Wednesday, we introduced Weird Wednesday with the last podcast. And the goal is to, of course, have more than one podcast per week, but we've been pretty busy. Yeah. Which is no excuse. We're just kind of letting you know we're not just sitting around twiddling our thumbs. So, uh, our last podcast, we talked about Andrew's Geyser, right? Yes. And we had cryptid guy, Christian, won't say his last name, just in case people are listening. Um, and we kind of had him out there, and we talked a little bit about, you know, Andrew's Geyser and the just general weirdness. And while we were there, honestly, it felt like a really weird sort of place to be. Yeah. You know, we had some sort of weird, you know, you know, you ever go into the woods or go anywhere and you just feel like something's watching you? Not someone, but something. That's what <laughs> it felt like. So, and we kind of did a quick look around and that sort of thing. And we got back to, you know, business and finished up our interview with him. And talking about Andrew Skyzer. And we agreed that we would come back and take another look. Yeah. And the <clears throat> second look, well, we added a another member to our paranormal slash cryptid research outing, if yes. you will. And that person was uh, Daniel from M&D Paranormal and Cryptid Research. Right? Yeah. So what we, what we had at that time was uh, Christian from Asheville Cryptid Society and Daniel from M&D Paranormal and Cryptid Research. Now, Christian and Daniel are both part of Asheville Cryptid Society. Okay, so I'm trying to get this clear for you guys. Right. <laughs> now, and to throw another monkey wrench into it, um, the Creep Geeks podcast, me and Omi, and I'm Greg, by the way, one of your hosts, and Omi is Omi. Hi. She's the other host, because it's a, a, what's dual host? Co-host. Co-hosted team type thing. <laughs> um, is We're actually part of M&D Paranormal as well. We're on the team. We're yep. the tech people. And... We're actually part of Asheville Cryptid Society. No, you are, because you've got the certificate. Oh, somebody just got called out, Christian. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. So anyway, we're kind of, 
we're, we're in this and we're all together. And we went back out to Andrew's geyser, right, to take a look to see what we could see because we were there the day before, experienced just some general weirdness, felt like we we're being looked at and watched, and, uh, you know, had some strange readings with a Geiger counter, that sort of thing. And it was pretty interesting. And we sort of talked about the history about it. So we went back. And what did we find? So, well, what I didn't put in the notes is what I wanted to talk about, which was, did it honestly feel different that time? What? Uh, when we went back? Yeah. To me, it felt completely different. So, the guys... As in, well, I mean to say yeah. what I felt. As in, I didn't have the same uneasy, we're being watched sort of feeling that I had the first time around. Yeah. Now, Greg was busy. He was interviewing Daniel and Christian and they were, you know, trying to figure out how the, we would record the day. Whereas me and Pepper, we kind of took off into the woods. We just, bye. And we kind of took off to do some photos and to do some exploring. And I can say the deeper you got into the woods and the closer you got to the water, the weirder things felt. Yeah. So um, at some point I was over half a mile away from everybody else and that's when the creepiness started to sink in for me. As Ooh. soon as I got back to you guys, I did not have that same uneasy I'm being watched feeling. Yeah, let me find some creepy music. <laughs> and for me, though, the I've got eyes on me, and even Pepper felt like she was being watched or there was something out there. I It was coming from a different direction. Yeah. So whether or not there was something supernatural, paranormal, cryptid that was out there keeping an eye on things, this time it was either further away or it was from a different direction. And who knows? There could be, I don't know, security people for property keeping an eye on us for all yeah, we Yeah. You, know? you know, but I mean, that's, that's kind of one of those, I don't know. See, yeah. with me, I have a couple different types of being watched feelings. Yeah. And if you're listening and can relate, you can definitely leave a comment. Uh, we have a Facebook group that you can check out and a Facebook page. It's called Creep Geeks, by the way. But, you know, I get the feeling sometimes when people are watching. Like, you feel like someone is watching you. That's one, one type of feeling that I get. Okay. And then I also get another feeling when I feel like something is watching me. And sometimes, you know, it, you, you, it might be like a bear or something like that. Something predatory. Yeah. Right? Which, you know... Is It is what it is. But then sometimes I get the feeling when I don't know what it is is watching me and it sets my radar off at a much higher level than someone or something like as an animal is watching me. Hmm. You know, and normally there comes the feeling of uh, with, with that, you know, a little uneasiness, dread, that kind of thing. Like okay. I just need to go ahead and go. But I didn't feel that this time hmm. th with our second adventure trip if you will yeah so and so after we got done doing a little bit of an interview and talking to those guys because we kind of walked around you know we got their um opinion if you will and sort of researched the area and it, i was talking to those guys about what they had thought seen that sort of thing and you were off taking pictures um uh, come to the conclusion that at that particular point in that particular part of the day that there was really not a whole lot that was remarkable yeah um there were some tracks some weird sort of tracks um which was described by daniel as possibly being a big ass rabbit <laughs> but it would have been a big you know, rabbit it had been like four foot tall rabbit kind of thing yeah and you know some other sign um a weird musty smell in the area that sort of thing um but overall nothing really remarkable yeah and it really didn't take that long to come to that conclusion. Did the interview, we walked around, we looked. Of course, I videotaped everything. And by videotape, since we don't use tape anymore, I just did a video about it. Um, that is uh, actually on our Cheap Geek channel, which is, I know sounds confusing. But just to kind of clear that up, we just want to see if there was a bigger audience for that kind of thing. Just a little uh, uh, experiment on our part. So mm -hmm. that video is actually up, and we'll put a link. It's going to be in our show notes. And the, everything we talk about, and anything of note that we talk about is uh, available in our show notes, which we do post on our website and that sort of thing. So it was really nothing remarkable. And during this interview, Daniel said, hey, we should go find the lost church. Yeah. 
And so what's the first thing you ask when you say, when you hear somebody say, hey, let's go find a lost church? What do you ask? Where is it? Yeah, (laughs) where is it? And he's like, I don't know. (laughs) Well, well, my first question would have been, what do you mean by lost church? Well, my first question was, where is it? Because I wanted to know how close it was. You know, if it was something that we could do during the day, because we weren't there very long um, at Andrew's Geyser. And if you haven't heard us talk about Andrew's Geyser, it's like a, it's a park with a man-made geyser with a rounded sort of five point star and some weird structures there that, you know, to us may or may not be sort of Masonic in nature. It's more than likely something else that's been put up there, but, uh, or designed by anyway. And it's in a valley type, a bowl shaped valley. Yeah. It's just unusual. It's an unusual with a major railway. With do a lot of duality. And then wilderness. Yes. And um, I, I did want to say, just because we didn't uh, feel or really see anything remarkable doesn't mean that it's not remarkable. We could go back and have that feeling again. We could go back and possibly see something else unusual there. Yeah. So, but at that point, because if it were cryptids, maybe they weren't there. Maybe they were someplace else. Yeah. We decided to do, let's go check out this lost church thing. Yeah. So, yeah. And and the thing about the lost church and why we were going to look for the lost church, um, it was a church that was in the, a heavily wooded area, or at least that's where it was supposed to be, or that's where it was supposed to be. Uh, but the cool thing that made it even worth the hike, if you will, was that supposedly, I shouldn't say post, allegedly, there was a cemetery there, right? Yeah. A Confederate-style cemetery. And one of the gravestone slash tombstone markers, if you will, uh, is supposed to have a stigmata. Really? Yeah. Which means that it bleeds. <laughs> okay. So we figured what better thing to do on a Wednesday is to go out there and uh, sort of check it out. So, um, and that's kind of what we did, right? So we kind of piled in the vehicles and took off. Okay. And when we, uh, we went and we couldn't find it. And then we went back another way, and we sort of found the general location of where Daniel thought it to be. And to his credit, he said it had been about six years since he went looking for this church. So, <laughs> okay, uh, with a pretty much a minimal amount of effort on our part, it just became a matter of doing a U turn and going back the other way. We could sort of come across it, right? Yeah. And uh, we were going to go out there and see if we can find it, and also to see since that area being heavily wooded the way it is and not necessarily well traveled. And very dense, and if you've ever been in, in the woods in North Carolina by the mountains, it's can be pretty dense. Um, as Daniel says, squatchy. It's a squatchy <laughs> area, right? And so we're thinking, okay, cool, we'll go out there, we'll sort of check it out, and maybe we can put to use some of our, our cryptid tracking skills that we had been picked up, uh, picking up on and using. Mm-hmm. And uh, did you learn any, any cryptid tracking skills from a cryptid guy and uh, Daniel? Um, a bit. Nope. <laughs> well, I mean, I do have some skills that I think are important that everybody should be aware of. Yes. Um, don't speculate too much, only because you will literally fall down a So what are these, are these rules? No, these are just my suggestions. Guidelines. Yeah. Okay. Do so not, why don't you read them how you wrote them in here, because okay. I thought they were pretty interesting. Yeah. Don't speculate too much. Yes. Because if you speculate and you start going down one rabbit hole, you'll just keep going down that rabbit hole, and you may miss some things that are very important. Yes. However, follow leads. If tracks, if you find weird tracks and they lead someplace, pay attention to the direction of those tracks, as well as, you know, maybe the depth of those tracks, uh, if the tracks seem like they're in a hurry, things like that. That's important because if, let's just say we found a Bigfoot track, and it took off at a fast pace, that means Bigfoot was running from something. Do you really want to get caught by whatever was scaring Bigfoot? No. Um, I don't know. That might be a little bit of a, a stretch. I know. And but also... You, so really what you're saying is is that it, if the tracks change, yeah, then you should be uh, a little bit more aware of maybe what's going on. Yeah. Right? And okay. Then, my most important thing is observe your environment because I actually found some of the weird tracks and it was simply by being observant 
keeping an eye on my surroundings, what I was stepping on, what I was walking through. And I was also keeping an eye on Pepper. And Pepper went over to a little area and started sniffing around. And that's where I discovered tracks. Yes. So. And to Pepper's yeah. credit, right in the middle of the track, <laughs> she pooped. <laughs> and so our paranormal Pepper, all 13 pounds of blazing fury, it's like, I see what you're doing here, and I shit on you. <laughs> Stop. So, all right. So anyway, be aware of your surroundings. Yeah. Right, observe the environment that you're in. Yes. Um, I would add if you run across a track or print, um, take pictures, document it. If you have something for scale, yeah. Um, and here's a little little tip for you: if you're going to use something to show scale, make sure it's a common object. Yes. You know, like a quarter. I, I don't know, a, a lighter, a big lighter. You know, something, something to show uh, in common context. The scale. Yeah. Um, Christian had a space pen that he put down there um, for scale for one of the tracks that we see, which is great. I am familiar with space pens. I know how long they are. But if you don't know how long they are, then it can be a little difficult. Also, is it a Fisher space pen, a NASA space pen, a geocaching space pen? It's not a geocaching okay. space pen because geocaching is... For suckers. <laughs> Would you stop? Yep. <clears throat> anyway, the point is, is that, you know, when you're going out there and you're looking for stuff, if you find stuff, the, the goal is if you show it to a, I kind of like this, this is sort of the rule I have, all right? If you show it to a common person, right, who has common sense, mm -hmm. they should come to the same conclusion. conclusion. So, if you show a reasonable person something, then they come to the same conclusion you do, then your job is done. You've done it correctly. So if I go up to you and provide you with some evidence and you're a reasonable person, you should come to the same conclusion or would agree or, you know, something. You know what I'm saying? Kind of like when a cop pulls you over. A cop has to be able to, you know, reasonable doubt, right? But he also has to be able to pr prove whatever it is you've done to what's considered to be reasonable, mm -hmm. I guess, in like a reasonable person. So that sort of thing. So anyway, we decided to go ahead and – Go to find the lost church. We found a church where Daniel had an experience in the past, that six years earlier, where he seen a strange light, like a, a ball of light in that church yeah. at uh, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, which there was no reason for it to be a flashlight. Like, who would be up and moving around, that kind of thing, in that church? Uh, he said the church was creepy, but that was not the church we were looking for. So, so we hiked across the tracks. Yeah. <laughs> and we hiked across these railroad tracks, which actually cut through the mountains, which is pretty neat. Pretty neat standing up there taking a look and taking a couple of pictures. And then out of nowhere, Christian identified bicycle tracks. Which is what I'm good at identifying. <laughs> know what I mean? Yeah. You put me out in the woods and somebody rode a bike through there, I can see those tire tracks and I can say with pretty good certainty a bicycle has gone through this area. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, anyway. Um, so, we, we kind of hiked through there, and we were hiking back to see if we could find this cemetery at the Lost Church, and it was entirely possible that that church wasn't there. Oh. It's entirely possible that cemetery wasn't there. It could have been grown over. I mean, you, you kind of have to know where it is in order to find it. Yeah. Yeah. Did we find it? No. We'll tell. Oh, I was going <laughs> to. What are you doing? You just wrecked it. I apologize to all those who were listening to the podcast. Because I was going to say, did we find it? You'll find out after this brief break. <laughs> Dang. We're going to go ahead and take a break. And we'll be right back. And you're listening to the Creep Geeks podcast. Okay. Should I play a commercial? Let's play a commercial for M&D. What do you think? Okay. Yeah. The goal of m and Paranormal. Did you hear that? The goal of m and Paranormal is... That's crazy. The we actually hear something. Do you hear something? Is to compassionately, knowledgeably, no, I mean stomping around. Offer paranormal I don't know. We're going to go investigate. We'll be right back. By paranormal experience, including those who have been indirectly affected. Services provided include paranormal investigation, property research, and evidence review of residential, business, and private property locations. Cleansing of these properties are available upon request. 
no matter the circumstances of the paranormal experience. MD Paranormal strive to offer a non judgmental environment to promote education, open communication, and empathy to each individual that chooses to share their experience or come into our service. In achieving this goal, MD Paranormal is building and bringing together a community of open and like minded individuals by offering free monthly gatherings and events at the Shop Eclectic, 49 State Street, Marion, North Carolina. Call us anytime at 828 484 1637 or 828 559 2818 or email us at MD Paranormal. And we're back. Okay. That was the Sasquatch Squad. I mean, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you hear stuff. So anyway, uh, during the break, we went and investigated that strange noise. And you know what tracks we found? What? We didn't. <laughs> found nothing. But no, it actually brings back to a point. See, and that's the thing with this whole thing, right? You're out there and you're like, we're going to investigate paranormal stuff. And we're going to investigate cryptid stuff. And we're going to get all loaded up and... You know, bring a kit out there in the woods for survival and just to make sure that we can get out there and do what we have to do and recapture and record evidence. Yeah. Sometimes you just don't find anything. And I, I dare say most of the time you don't find stuff. Yeah. And I, I mean, you might find some stuff, but unless it's without a shadow of a doubt, then you're just be like, okay, well, that's interesting or an anomaly of sorts. And then you kind of have to kind of keep on, keep on keeping on, right? But doesn't that kind of speak to our our hashtag IRL in real life series? Yes, it does. Because it, the parallel would be on television and on a lot of the, the streaming channels now. You watch these shows and every single episode has some sort of evidence of something. Whether it's yeah. a ghost hunting show or a Bigfoot type show or aliens Every single one has some sort of evidence. Yeah. Uh, we were just watching a UFO show where they made sure in the first two episodes they found something. And that's not always the case because now we're yeah, on. Yeah, I would have to say that's pretty much yeah. a rarity. Because now Greg and I together, we have been to this location four times. Yes. Uh, and then with Christian, that's a total of two times with him. And now we've brought Daniel into the fold. And this last time. Not much. Yeah. You know? And that's also uh, part of what's going on with the podcast. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know we talked about this sort of thing. Uh, just in general. Anything we come across we think is weird, wacky, wonderful, well, we talk about it. 
right? Yeah. And there's a lot of podcasters out there that do exactly the same thing. They talk about this subject, that sort of thing. And they go out there and they, they talk and they talk around it. Um, we're actually doing it. So we decided a long time ago, um, you know, that we should try to experience. And by experience, we should actually go out and try to get experience to experience what's actually going on with the things that we talk about. Yeah. So we joined you know, a paranormal encrypted research team with M and D and we've been making contacts so that we can go out there and experience it for ourselves. So we are a podcast that talks about these weird, wacky, wild, and wonderful things. And we're also part-time paranormal investigators slash cryptid investigators. Yeah. Isn't that neat? It's like a trial by fire. Yeah. We're going, we're going out there and doing it. Head first into the whole genre, I guess. Yeah. You know? And uh, it's been fun so far. So we have uh, enjoyed what we're doing. So it's a it's a good thing. So we kind of add that to our repertoire, yeah. if you will. So we went out in the woods, and it was a nice day for a walk. And one of the more random sort of interesting conversations that was had was, are y'all going to go to the Liver Mush Festival? Oh, gosh. <laughs> and uh, I'm not a Liver Mush fan at all. I think it's kind of gross. I have never had liver mush, but it sounds terrible. I mean, well, you know, honestly, if you like liver, you'll probably like it. I just, to me, it's a texture thing. I just, I'm just not into it. But Maybe evidently, Pepper there's would a, like it. Probably. Yeah. But evidently, there's a lot of people who do, and it's a festival. And if you're interested, it's going to be in Marion, North Carolina. And when it is, I have no idea. But we'll find out, let you know. But yeah, it's just sort of an off the wall question. Uh, I was like. Uh, but and gross. I, I brought up the fact that, like, okay, in New Mexico we have green chili festivals. Yeah, well, I mean that's delicious. And then um, there's a place in California that actually has a garlic festival, which and I can see that being yeah. pretty good too. Get your garlic overload, you know. But see, the problem with the garlic festival is on the way home you got to breathe on each other. <laughs> like, hey, I'm gonna need you to crack the window. Yeah. Oh, the liver mush festival is. June 1st. So, if you're listening to this podcast and you're in Western North Carolina and you feel that you need to attend the Liver Mush Festival, it will be June 1st in Marion, North Carolina. Oh, gosh. And just in case you were wondering where that might be, uh, it's about 20 miles away from Asheville, <laughs> heading back the other way. Okay. So, 40 East would be your best way to get there. Yeah. And the reason why we tell you this sort of thing is that we're givers. It's you know, still a part of that weird fact stuff is. that we like to I throw in I just thought it was there. crazy. It's like, what? A liver? I mean, it makes sense that you think about it, but I'm like, a liver mush festival? Well, North Carolina. I mean, if they can have festivals about corn and squash and just general dumb stuff, <laughs> I guess there's no wrong with having a liver mush festival other than to me it tastes like garbage. North Carolina needs so. to have a major crop that everybody can celebrate. Well, they do. It's called tobacco. And we're not allowed to celebrate that. Well, anymore. So. But, you know. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's, it's just kind of is what it is. So yeah, I thought it was pretty interesting. So as we were cruising through the woods, the only thing that happened of real note was that we met a ninja lady. <laughs> okay. And the reason why I call her ninja lady is that myself and Daniel were inspecting a millipede about eight inches long as it was cruising across the uh, trail there. And we were looking at it, you know. As you do, kind of hiked up on hiking sticks and go, oh, look at that thing. And we're kind of watching it. And so I decided to do a little video of this millipede cruising around. And you were ahead of us on the trail. And we both heard you say something. And so we both looked at you. And, and you weren't you looking at us. You were just doing your thing. And it was like, huh. Because we thought you said, you know, hey, I'm not trying to scare you. And so we were looking at you. And then the lady said it again. And she was behind us. <laughs> Which, in turn, scared the crap out of me. I'm like, whoa, where did you come from? Because it was like she threw her voice. I mean, it was like dead coming from your direction. And we both looked. You know what I mean? Yeah. And she's like, hey, I didn't want to start you, you know, because I'm coming up behind you. And we did not hear her at all. And, you know, to, to her credit, being super stealthy, wearing her little hippie shoes. What do they call those little Teva sandals? Those little rubbery, you know, hippie no, sandals? They're just basic Tevas. 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Basic <laughs> divas. Like I would know anything about that, and, right? And she had some capri pants on and a regular t-shirt. She wasn't dressed as a ninja. She was a freaking ninja. You didn't even see her until she got up on you. Actually, I saw her twice. I also saw her sneak up on somebody in the group. Yes. <laughs> Well, anyway, <laughs> she was trying to get past this, and I said, hey, watch out for this millipede. This things, these things can jump like 10 feet. And she said, I don't believe that. I'm like, all right, well, go ahead then. You know, and she did, so she didn't believe. So anyway, and we kind of kept going, and you know, Christian was in the lead for whatever race he was on with us to go find the lost cemetery, and she snuck right up on him and got him too. <laughs> So it's like she snuck up on all of us, man. And, you know, and then if I thought it was funny because he comes back to talk to us. And he'd asked this lady, stranger, ninja lady, hey, do you know where a cemetery is? <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, you know, we're, we're looking for gravestones, uh, which is probably a weird conversation to have with complete strangers in the woods. You know, but I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, I don't think we look that dangerous. I mean, we got a video camera, a small dog, and we're just kind of walking through the woods, right? Yeah. So uh, so we hiked on, and we did not find gravestones, headstones, tombstones, whatever you want to call them. So thus, no stigmata, and we found no church whatsoever. So I'm going to have to do more research because I really want to find that. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, you know, it, it may be there. It may be you have to hike four miles in or whatever, and, and that's okay. okay. So we decided to stand around and talk for a minute. And there was a, a sort of a wide creek with rushing water. And we watched our little dog, Pepper, attempt her very first water crossing on her own. Because usually she's like, man, wants no part of it. And I have to carry her. Uh, but she made her way across. So that was pretty exciting. <laughs> then we had a conversation about, you know, it's kind of started with, with, with Daniel saying, if I had a cup, I'd drink this water. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like. Mm. No, you won't. I'm like, I wouldn't drink it. And Christian said, you, you know, you, you could probably give yourself some issues by drinking that water, you know. And he was like, he said, I grew up drinking this water. So I thought, well, that's kind of gross. But anyway, I mean, I guess, you know, river water and all that stuff. We've been so sort of, you know, river water, creek water, mountain water. I mean, we've been so sort of like in this what, 22nd century or whatever it is, you know, you can't be just drinking wild water. Yeah. Well, it's got to be filtrated. And then, like, in New right? Mexico. It's got to be filtered and cleaned for taste and yeah. put in bottles <laughs> so we can pay a dollar for it. But even still, even, in, like, in New Mexico, it didn't matter if the water was running, if it was stagnant, if it was, like, at 10,000 feet out elevation. Because New Mexico has so little water, everything finds a way to nest in it grow hatch eggs yeah whatever, and it didn't you know? really taste very good either it's a lot of sulfur yeah. a lot of weird stuff but i mean this is mountain water man so i'm sure it tasted amazing but i just don't know if i could if in the world situation yeah i'm drinking it you yeah. know i'll filter it through two tube socks and some underwear <laughs> which was an alternative <laughs> method of water filtration that we talked about while pepper was doing the crossing i'm yeah. very proud of her yeah so we can filter out that mud water so um, and then another reason why we shouldn't drink the water, or we talked about bottled water for a brief second. You came back across with Pepper and said most bottled water has microplastics in it now, so that's something to watch out for. Yeah, that was something I learned last year. In fact, there's many companies doing presentations on it. Yeah. Yeah. So how would one get rid of these microplastics? By using more refined processes to filter their water for the general public. So, so, it, so the water places is going to need to employ a better filtration technique. Yes, and there's hmm. certain big companies that everybody buys their water from that would face a major loss because they don't want to implement those machines. Well, I'm sure the expense would be tremendous. <coughs> yeah. When I was in the military, part of what we had to do was we had to replace uh, filters because a lot of our electronic gear, these huge cabinets, <coughs> were actually water-cooled, hmm. which is kind of a rarity, but... It was a system put in place in the, you know, 60s and 70s to help sort of, you know, chill the equipment so that it wouldn't get so hot. And uh, I remember replacing these filters, and they were like, you know, five micron filters, which is pretty good to make sure it sort of, you know, wouldn't clog anything up so that your gear would stay um, ice and cool. And I remember uh, being in there, a little, little fun story for you. Uh, I remember being into uh, being in a space where we had some of our equipment, and I can't tell you what it is because... That's not what I can do. But 
uh, this gentleman opened up the cabinet, and these cabinets were basically were really tall, you know, and they had drawers, and you could just grab these two handles, lift it up, and um, the uh, interlock would turn off the electricity so you wouldn't kill yourself to death. Um, we're playing with this high voltage stuff. And when he opened it up, uh, somehow or another, one of the, the water jackets uh, that kind of passed the water around to help cool things, it sprung a leak. So when he pulled that cabinet drawer open, it was high voltage stuff, right? Because the reason why he was messing around with it to begin with is that the interlock wasn't working. So when you opened it, it stayed energized, which is not good. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when he pulled it open, it was completely full of water. And the look on his face, I'll never basically forget. <laughs> because I didn't see it because I started running. <laughs> Because we're talking high voltage, right? Yeah. The kind of voltage that will make the hair on your arms stand up when you're standing next to it. These things energize. And he pulled it open and it sloshed and I took off out of there and he and I, I turned around and he was right beside me. I was like, man, is it supposed to do that? <laughs> and he was like, no. And then you got to figure out how to turn off something that should have turned off to begin with. And then how do you get all that water out of there? Because this thing was full of circuit cards and, and super high voltage type stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And the good thing is, is that since it was filtered, it was also deionized water. And it's, uh, that's probably the reason why it didn't. But yeah. And we employed this amazing tool to get that water out of there. You know what it was? A bucket? No. Oh. A shop vac. <laughs> Vacuum cleaner, right? He got most of it out of there, and then basically he had to clean it. It was his piece of gear. I just happened to be there, um, but yeah, it was pretty shocking. It's like wow, but yeah, yeah. So anyway, there's your water story. Okay. Microplastics are in water, and you're going to need at least five micron filters to get some of those microplastics out. Um, Daniel used to drink basically creek water growing up. Um, it should be filtered if you're going to do that sort of thing. An alternative method for filtering would be two socks in your underwear like Bear Grylls style, right? We met a ninja lady who was very sneaky. Pepper did a water crossing. We found some cryptid tracks, which we can't really identify. Didn't have the same remarkable feeling, and we learned, uh, you know, basically some uh, general tracking methods from uh, Daniel and Christian. You know, so Daniel's yeah. M&D Paranormal, and Christian's the uh, cryptid guy from Asheville Cryptid Society. You also learn that we're all in this together as we're out there trying to do our thing. We're podcasters that are actually going out in the field to find the information. And Andrew's guys are pretty creepy. Yeah. Generally. So as we uh, finished up with the water crossing and speculating about water, we started to head back. And guess who snuck up on us again? The ninja lady. Yep, sure did. Come cruising right on past us and got us all again. (laughs) <laughs> except for me except for you <laughs> I, I don't know but m- the first time she actually got pepper too so yeah she was super quiet yeah but the second time she didn't get you but got me and i told her i said well, that's the second time you've scared the hell out of me yeah she thought that was funny so <sighs> so anyway uh, as we were heading back and this was basically a long walk spoiled by um the ninja lady uh we did hear some strange very strange vocalizations so, yeah, yeah, and they were coming from, you know, it echoed and it sounded like it was coming from all around us. And do you remember what those vocalizations were? No. Kids. <laughs> Down at that church. Because yeah, when we stopped, we found the one church that, that Daniel had talked about. Um, we just saw, saw a strange light. And that church was like down in a, in a valley bowl, if you will. And when these kids were out there hooping and hollering, it just echoed everywhere. Hmm. It was kind of crazy. So, yeah. Yeah. So that was that. So for our uh, wonderful Weird Wednesday, the continuation of our high strangeness in North Carolina, Andrews Geyser, come up with nothing. That's it. So should we talk a little bit about the people we went with? Sure. Okay. Go ahead. Well. Would you like some people talking about music? (laughs) Sure, I can find a little something. What do you think? No, go ahead. Sure. So the cryptid guy, Christian, of Asheville Cryptid Society. Yes. He offers lectures, talks, research, and investigations on various cryptids in the western North Carolina region and surrounding areas. Uh, We did recently attend his Bigfoot 101 
Talk, uh, hosted at REI in Asheville. And he's got some breaking news, and that news is that he now has access to a, a database that you can submit your Bigfoot sightings and Sasquatch dogman experiences to. We will put a link to that in the show notes, as well as his website. And uh, also, Pepper likes him, so... Yeah, it's kind of weird. Yeah, she's she's a little standoffish to some people. So, yes. Yeah. Now, Daniel of M and D, uh, we did join M and D um, Paranormal and Cryptid Research. He is the D of M and D, and he is a Bigfoot crypt and Cryptid researcher and experiencer. Besides paranormal investigations, his experiences led him to searching for tangible but elusive creatures such as Bigfoots and Sasquatch. Dogman. Yeah, Dogman. Um, Wood boogers. And we hope to get Daniel, you know, on an upcoming podcast episode to share more of his experiences. He, he had a very interesting childhood in uh, Tennessee. So he has a blog as well as a website, uh, mndparanormal.blogspot.com. And he just launched his YouTube channel for MND Paranormal, where you guys get to see evidence of some of the paranormal investigations he's been on. Yeah, and it's not just M and D yeah. as far as him. It's a team that they have. So you have Daniel and Tess and Mary. Yeah. Uh, along with Brandon and Lizzie and Jen. Yeah, and Jen and Leah. Yeah. Uh, and Crow. And us. Yes. And I'm not sure if I'm missing anybody. If I am, I apologize. But so it's a team sort of thing and, and Daniel is the you know the, the pointy headed point man if you will, for this for right now. So yeah, uh, it's pretty neat. And so Christian's uh, doing his thing as well. And together they're in, they're in Asheville Cryptid Society where they do this sort of thing. They go out and investigate. And uh, you know, all kidding aside, we're in there too, so we're part of that. And we're, we are excited to be able to go out and experience some experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, anyway... That's pretty much how it went for that for this particular Weird Wednesday. But coming up, our next Weird Wednesday is High Strangeness, Georgia. Yes. The Georgia Guidestones. Yes. Yes. So you can look forward to that. That'll be coming out uh, next week on the podcast along with a video that course sort of corresponds with our audio podcast. And you'll be able to find it on YouTubes. And there'll be a link when that actually happens. And um, one of the things that we had an experience with um, in the past since we've talked last was we attended the gathering in Marion, and it was uh, the Past Lives Gathering. Yeah. Yes. Where Bobby B., who we've had on a podcast before, who's talked about past lives and past lives regressions for uh, Asheville Past Lives. Um, okay, so this was, it was kind of a weird thing, right? Mm-hmm. So when you talk about past lives and past lives regression, or experiences. Or, or experiences is basically being able to reflect and look back into yourself to maybe get a glimpse of maybe a past life that you've led, right? Mm -hmm. Or had a past life experience, you know? So if you're looking into the idea of, of um, what you did possibly in a past life, if you believe in that sort of thing, you know, it would be good to have a guide, if you will, to be able to get to that point to maybe take a look and see. Or maybe experience something that you, you've had uh, happen in one of your past lives. So Bobby came down to the Shop Eclectic in Marion, North Carolina, and he put on a little, little talk because they, the Shop Eclectic in, in Marion, North Carolina does gatherings. Once a month, they do a gathering, right, where mm -hmm. somebody comes in and uh, an expert, if you will, talks about subjects. And, and Bobby came down to talk about past lives and past life experiences, right? Yes. And he went through and gave a little... Uh, sort of talk about the background of it and, and um, the reason behind it and how you can experience it. And then he did a demonstration. Remember? Yes. To where, you know, using his guided direction without actually having to be hypnotized, which I thought was unusual, um, but it makes sense to me now because it used to be whenever you wanted to, you know, or whenever you thought about going back and maybe looking into a past life, you had to be hypnotized, but evidently that's not the case. And through guided exercise and uh, a little bit of concentration and relaxation and direction from Bobby, um, uh, the people that were there in attendance were able to experience some past live stuff. Yes. And, you know, and more than not, 
uh, the people there, a lot of people had, were able to bring up some details about possible past lives. Hmm. Yeah. I thought it was kind of cool. I'm not going to say what they were, because um, it kind of is what it is, but it was really interesting. So I'm glad Bobby came down to do that. I'm glad we were able to attend as, uh, as we like to go to these gatherings. And if you're in you know, Western North Carolina and you'd like to go see something like that or hear someone, uh, an expert talk about certain things for absolutely no charge at all, you should check them out and you can, you know, find the shop eclectic on Facebook and there'll be a link, um, for the upcoming past live topics and subjects. So, um, mm. uh, it was pretty, pretty good. So, but overall we had a pretty good time out in the woods cruising around with, uh, Christian and Daniel, uh, it seems like you're rather genuine in what they do. And we have the video for that. So, yeah, pretty neat. I just want to go again and go looking for, like, Bigfoot. Well, so. uh, evidently, this entire area is rife with Bigfoot sightings. <laughs> so, we'll uh, be, I'm sure, going out again. And a little spoiler, uh, I'm sure that there is a place in North Carolina where we're going to be camping before too long, which will be an excellent investigation area. Yeah. I'm not going to say where it is, and primarily because I don't know where it is. Okay. But Daniel does, right? Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to be able to pop out there and see that. And, of course, if we do, videotape and audio podcast will follow. So, anyway, what do you think? Oh. Well, Are you excited? Yes. Very nice. Okay, well. Well, um, let's see. I do want to remind everybody, if you want to interact with us, like our Facebook fan page, Creep Geeks Podcast. And if you want to ask questions or share stories, things like that, we do have a Facebook group that is Creep Geeks Facebook group. Just type it into the search bar. You'll find it. And we do have active moderators and admins that will help you out. Um, And we're pretty active in the group as well. We also have an Instagram. Be sure to like us on Instagram. That is Instagram.com. And then search Creep Geeks Podcast. Uh, If you need to email us, contact at CreepGeeks.com. Or shoot us a message on Facebook, Twitter, anywhere. We're quick to answer. Yes. Yes. Very nice. Mm Mm-hmm. All righty, so you've been listening to the Creep Geeks Podcast. This is episode number 121. And this episode was High Strangest in North Carolina. Asheville Cryptid Society, MD Paranormal Encrypted Research, and basically looking for the lost church and Sasquatch with Asheville Cryptid Society and MD. So, do appreciate you listening. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, just get a hold of us. But other than that, that's really about all I got. All right. What about you? No, nope, that's it. Okie dokie. Thanks for listening, everybody. Very nice. So, see you later. Take it easy. Bicycle. Bye. Just as you watch me bleed